nice to see you. Welcome to the program today. I'm your boyfriend, George Strombolopoulos. Uh, looking forward to hanging out with you as always. Uh, okay, we are a nation filled with unique and powerful voices, some of which are never heard because of shyness uh, or self-esteem or just feeling so marginalized that you can't, as Bruce Coburn say, kick through the darkness to get to the, the daylight, right? Well, sometimes people overcome that. Rita McNeil overcame all of that, and we lost a powerful voice uh, last night, a voice for optimism, a voice for feminism when it seemed radical, a voice that just sometimes sang incredibly beautiful songs, and as Rita proved to all of us, sometimes your voice is that much stronger because of all that you've been through. So, as you know, we've had a chance to have Rita McNeil on our TV show over this past year, and today we're gonna replay that conversation uh, with you, an interview from in December. She was about to head out on a Christmas tour. And at the end of the conversation, I asked her which Canadian stereotype is absolutely true. And her answer, well, it just summed up who she was and why so many people loved her. Rita McNeil will be missed by so many. She did see the good in everyone. And when sometimes the good was hard to find, she still found it. Before our conversation, though, and I'm really looking forward to sharing this with you, for Rita, here's her story. If you're going to make it as a singer, it's not just about how well you sing. Sometimes you just have to own it. You're flying on your own. For Rita McNeil, that wasn't always easy. Growing up in Cape Breton, Rita was a shy girl, and the physical and psychological impact of multiple surgeries for cleft palate didn't help with the self-esteem. When you're young and you have some uh, affliction like that to you, it's the, the biggest uh, thing in the world. But Rita's confidence started to grow in the 70s when she aligned herself with the feminist movement and started writing songs like this. We're here to say in our own way, we want an end. After that, Rita was on her way, writing songs and telling stories about the people she knew in Nova Scotia. It's a work of man Those songs and Rita herself connected with people. Her weekly variety series on CBC was really successful. You shake my nerves and you rattle my brain. More than 20 albums, three Junos and a Gemini, Rita's gifted this country with the kind of music that's always sounded like home. for coming on the program. Well, I love your show. Oh, you're very sweet. I'm very happy to be here. And you're back on the road. How's, how's that been? It's been amazing. I'm having a great tour and getting to see lots of folks across the country. And seeing people that you haven't seen in a while. Well, that's right. It yeah. gives you an opportunity to reconnect with the audience and get your songs out there. You know, a lot of people you know, know you from the Christmas specials and will know you from the CBC Variety Show. But in the very beginning, when you came to Toronto, yes. I mean, it, you were you were the Ani DeFranco of your time, Fem <laughs> feminist. I mean, tell me about the Toronto Women's Caucus back then. Well, I was very involved, and it was a rediscovery of uh, things for me. And it was sort of a pivotal, pivotal point in my life where I learned to, uh, to use my music to communicate what I was feeling at the time. And I was involved in all kinds of issues, and I did a lot of... Uh, carrying placards and demonstrations and s writing songs that pertain to what we were all trying to deal with. And uh, yes, I was very much involved in the 70s, so. What, what were you feeling at the time? Well, I think for myself and for a lot of the women involved, as I say, we were learning about ourselves and, and learning that uh, things could be equal and things could get better and daycare could get better and all these things were possible for women. And uh, I was learning so much about, about all of this and how we all had similar ideas and feelings and how strong it is when people come together to share these feelings that change can happen. I've got a clip of you talking about this kind of stuff from back in the day. Watch this. I wasn't aware that women were organizing. Women were doing things to better themselves, sort of speak in a, a different way than I was taught. I mean, better myself outside of the marriage. I think I was good within that framework for the time I was in it. But me as a person out of it, that was a whole new thing to me. Very young girl, huh? Very young. Yeah. Yes, very young. What would you, uh, if you could go back and just whisper something into her ear, what would you say? Speak up. <laughs> <laughs> You've probably heard that before, right? I have, I Don't have. Screw them. Yes, speak the way you want to speak. That's right. You know, often there's that, there's that distance between 
the audience and the person on stage, but for you it's always seemed to be about community. It has. It's very important that uh, I connect with the audience. I've been known as a very uh, nervous performer all my life. And so when I get out there and I feel the presence of the people and I feel that we're all connecting, it's just the most incredible feeling there is. And it's that coming together that, that's so important. The, the, the sense of community, how, how much is it connected to your upbringing? Because your upbringing is, you're in one of the most beautiful places this country's ever had, but you've had such a challenging story and the things you had to go through as a kid. Yes, Were you well, striving for community? Um, I, I had challenges, but so many, many others as well. And coming from Cape Breton, it's just an amazing place to live. And uh, family is very important, and friends. And the culture, of course, is the music. So all those things going for you make you stronger and keep you grounded. Well, we, we like to remember our families nostalgically, and hopefully we remember the good things. But your family, I mean, you went through some serious stuff. You were dealing with sexual abuse, there's lots of alcoholism ran, ran in the yes, house. Yes, there was. Back yes. in the moments, did you ever feel like you could break through those clouds? Sometimes the clouds were really, really thick, and I wasn't ever sure, but uh, I've been born a very, uh, uh, very much an optimist, and I always uh, kept looking for the better, and I knew it was there. And even when all this was going around, it, although it was bad, there was also a lot of good. These are good people that had some rough times, mm -hmm. just like we all do. And unfortunately, when you're a child living through it, it makes it that much harder. When did you first see that it was gonna get better? Well, I think music has always been my savior. And, uh, any time I would sing, I would always feel that better side, that better part. Mm -hmm. So I just kept singing. <laughs> <laughs> what, what were the songs that you were singing at home when you were a kid? Oh, well, we used to listen to Wheeling, West Virginia, uh, Don Ho from Hawaii, anything you could scratch in on the radio. And then, of course, people would drop by and play the fiddle, mm -hmm. play the piano, step dance and sing. So music, a big part of it, big part of growing up. Those yes. early moments, were they a challenge? Very much so, terrifying. It would be oftentimes you would have to come and find me just before I was to go on stage. I'd be so scared I wouldn't know how I was going to do it. I, I've gone through that period in my life where it was terrifying just to get in front of an audience. I still have stage fright, but certainly not to the degree I used to. And that's because the people in this country have given me such a career and have loved me back so much that they're ma they've made the challenges easier. How, Expo, you were in your early 40s when Expo yes, happened? Yes, yes. What, what do you think the impact was on your career, your life, just getting that n recognition a little bit later on? I was very fortunate. I didn't look at it in terms of age. I looked at it in terms of timing. And, uh, you know, it, it was a struggle for me to get to where, I, to where I, I did finally arrive. So 22, 42, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> Stick around more with Reed McNeil right after this. Tricky. You're forcing Reed McNeil and her band to harvest dope at gunpoint. You could be a little bit nicer, you know. We could be a little bit faster. Stop being such a dick. I'm sorry. There's a nice one here, dear. Thanks. I'm sorry for yelling at you guys, but we've got to get the stuff out of here. I've only got an hour is the big problem here. Like, I'm not trying to be mean. <laughs> Could you ever in your wildest dreams have figured out that you'd be pushing weed on television? <laughs> no, no. I, I waited for that part for years. <laughs> <laughs> did you accept that right away? Did you, have to, did you hum and haul over that position? Well, I wondered why they would want me on the trailer park, boys, yeah. but I read the script and I said, I'm doing it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the language is a little bit different than some oh, of this. It's different, yeah. but nothing I haven't heard. No, for sure. <laughs> you go back to that young girl that came to Toronto to work at the Eaton Centre, yes. right? Or work at the Eaton's in Beer Toronto, right? Right, I did right for years. And you were a teen mom, too, back then. I was. In a different era. In a different time, yes. A, now, if a, if a young girl gets pregnant, and it's, it's a shock to the family, perhaps. Yes, yes. A young boy has, has a baby, but it's not... Like, back then, it must have been a, quite a thing. It was quite a thing, and I was really worried, but my mom and dad were amazing. Both of them were amazing people, and they 
took me through difficult times, and God bless them for that. What's interesting is that even when you wrote about it in your book, we just refer to the, to the man yes. as the Italian man, the Sicilian, yes. right? Yes. And then we don't know anything else. No. You just kept it quiet. Yes. I still do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't need to know his name, but I'm, I mean, unless you want to. But I'm just curious. No, you don't have to. That's not my business. But no. I do think it's funny because you, like, you, you always tend to have this sort of smiley outlook at some of this stuff. Yes. Has, have you ever, it was, it was contact? I mean, there was never contact never. after, not, not one, once. Did no. he go back to Italy? I have no idea. Interesting. So I have no idea. He could be in the audience. <laughs> Time to play anthropology. You ready? Rapid fire questions for your answer. Cape Breton, a long history of shipwrecks, from Navy ships to merchant marines, and some say even pirates. So I ask you, is it true that the island's haunted? Yes. Have you seen ghosts? Yes. Come on, really? Oh, yes. Talk to me about these ghosts. Well, when I was growing up, there was ghosts in Big Pond. And uh, there's a bridge there called Braxbrook Bridge. And it was noted that the parish priest would never go across that bridge at night unless he was accompanied by someone. Mm -hmm. And uh, my relatives often seen ghosts. And ghost stories are a big part of our, our family history. So yes, we do believe in them. What's the one Canadian stereotype that is absolutely true and you love it? Kind and nice people. We have that, don't we? We do. Rita McNeil, everybody.